Şimdi e, panelle, panelistlerimize çağırmak isteriz e, açık oturum için. E, I would like to ask you guys again back to stage please. Um, I'll do the introductions in Turkish but then we will do the panel in, in English. Uh, so, uh, Elger Plitz. Uh, Elger daha önce de bizimle olduğu İstanbul'da e, onun e, zorluğunun yanındaki park için tasarladığı e, dev kaydraktan ben kayamadım korktuğumdan ama umarım siz ya da çocuklarınız kaymıştır. E, aynı şekilde Avşar e, Bilgi Üniversitesi'nde e, oyun üzerine dersler veriyor ve bizimle çok sık e, bu proje içerisinde bulundu. Neslihan ev sahibimiz. Bernard Van Leer Vakfı'ndan. Ee, o da bizimle şu an, e, özellikle e, sosyal yardım projeleri içerisinde yaptıklarını konuşuyor olacağız onunla da beraber. Okay. Okay, thank you so much for the lovely presentations. Uh, we will do this in, in English so that it's more smooth and flowing and then uh, And then the questions, of course, can come in Turkish also. Um, I'll, I'm thinking of this format. Uh, I want to kind of ask our uh, respondents first a question and then uh, to trigger a response from them uh, and then kind of also encourage them to ask a question to one of you guys to further the discussion. And in a way, I would like to start with Avşar because Avşar, you've been um, teaching on play and I'm And, I, and I've tried that also last semester uh, at Kadir Has uh, a little bit with Gregers. Uh, teaching on play is actually kind of a difficult thing to do because you cannot test the result and anything, anything could be cool or not. Uh, so how, how do you actually evaluate uh, the results um, when you're teaching uh, a design studio that looks at play? So, uh, we try to make the students actually finish their products and really test it out. Um, uh, this can be a proposal for a playground and last year uh, two students were actually able to um, build their playground ideas, one in a school, uh, the Happy Goat School, and, the, uh, and inside Central Campus and they were able to uh, test it out and see the results. Okay, so actually, so you have created the best case scenario where we were earlier also discussing that uh, the design of play needs to, uh, or designing for children somehow has to incorporate the end user into it. Uh, maybe not only for children, but all of um, urban, urban design. Um, do you, would you like to say more about the presentations that uh, Tim and Alexandra made? Uh, yes, actually, um, there are, Two very important things, um, my opinion. One is this risk taking. Um, as you have said, children have to take risks and they like to take risks. And uh, from my own experience and from my observations, I see that they're um, taking risk, risks gradually. They first jump uh, over like 30 centimeters, then they try 50 centimeters, then one meter, then two meters or so. And at a, when a point is reached that they cannot go on, they stop. Um, so if, if we are designing a, a playground or if we are thinking about children's play, we should keep that in mind that uh, they need it, they want it, and uh, they do it uh, in a responsible way most of the time. And the second thing is uh, the association. Uh, I think the, um, the, the playground equipment we have is um, mostly the, the abstraction of nature, like uh, these parallel bars or um, a climbing bar is a tree. Uh, the, the slide is a slope uh, in the forest or, uh, or spring-loaded uh, animals are the real animals. So these are the abstractions of nature. Um, but when the playground equipment becomes uh, over-specific, and too, too defined, that kind of, for me, kills the this associative character of, uh, of the play, uh, playground itself. Um, and it doesn't fit the, the ambiguous nature of uh, the children's play. Yes. Uh, yeah, this uh, will come to you, but I, then I really request you to ask a question as well. Um, My question to you, uh, yeah, if you know Algar's work, and we will hopefully look at it tomorrow uh, in the last panel, uh, in tom tomorrow's program, um, there is definitely a lot of scary looking things. Uh, in what, uh, 
scary, but in a way also super exciting looking things. I'm, I'm saying scary as a mother. So because there's, uh, for example, there's a five meter tower uh, in, in the Zorlu playground in Istanbul uh, that you can only climb there by really testing all your climbing capacity. Uh, and I've, as a designer, uh, the, the whole problem of being sued or is, is always kind of at the back of one's mind how to design something that's non-standard. And uh, I'm really curious about that experience, uh, that it can be done is super encouraging. What does it take to get it done is a question. Can everybody hear me? Yes, okay. It's a good question. First thing I always say, it's not rocket science. If we can build a skyscraper, according to the building code, why not build a, it's a 12 meter high tower? Then we have a curse, that's the standard, the safety standard, but it also works for us because it's try, trying to eliminate um, not accepted risks, but you know how to work with it. So the tower, for instance, you cannot drop down any more than what is allowed within that standard. Um, the other thing is that we can bring a lot of... Um, Actually, the trick is how can you make it feel still within this protected world as if you are going on an adventure? And that's what we try to do there. Again, within the standard, and there is independent people that have to check that for me and sign it off. So from a um, responsibility uh, perspective, there's not much of a problem because there's always a third party that has to approve. So there is actually very strict standards that can be creatively reinterpreted. Um, they are brought to us as being very strict, but it's a big grey area. Um, and I shouldn't say, but we try to make use of that grey area and see if we can get the right people to follow what we are thinking from that safety perspective. Um, I, can, I showed you an example of a hill of 65 meters high uh, that nobody believes that you can build it within the standard. It is actually possible if you know more about the standard than the people that have written the standard. <laughs> so last time I asked you this question, you told me, Salva, do your homework. And, uh, but I'll give you <laughs> one more example. Risk, uh, dealing with risk with the standard is very strange. Coming from the Netherlands, we have a lot of water. We can put a fence around it and prevent people from falling in. But you can also learn to swim as a child. Then you can fall in. It's just how you want to look at it. And would you like to ask a question? Yes, this is a, this is a little bit. Um, I noticed uh, that we do have the idea that a child-friendly environment is necessarily also a natural looking environment. Um, that's what we see often. There's this tendency of making it natural, where most of us are living in a city. And do you also believe that it's possible to make artificial, intriguing playgrounds that have to deal with the uh, constraints within a city fabric? Actually, in, in the chapter of my book on playgrounds, I basically divide playground design into three categories. Um, they're the abstractionists, who are people, I think, who are generally inspired a lot by Isama Noguchi, the sculptor, who began designing these very challenging, very highly abstract playgrounds starting in the 1930s. Um, then there are the manufacturers, who are the people who are like not interested in the gray area, but just conforming to those safety standards. And then there are the junkologists who believe that we shouldn't design playgrounds at all. Children should design their own fun. And I think the base of that is the sand gardens that I talked about in my um, presentation, but that can also mean cardboard play, you know, play like the classic junk playground has like construction refuse and dirt and tools. So, I mean, I believe that both the abstractionists and the junkologists can work. The abstractionists, I think of as providing kind of a stage for children's play to happen on, like something that sparks a child's imagination that's a little bit different than the everyday streetscape, and then, you know, they can create their own narrative. Um, it's when 
playgrounds provide so much narrative. You know, when they have to make the climbing structure in the U.S., there are a lot of them that look like an old west town. And it's like, <laughs> you shouldn't be really playing cowboys and Indians anymore. But also, like, why suggest that to the child? It's not necessary. Like, it's just a slide. And in fact, they can come up with a thousand things that the slide can be if we would just kind of back off. Playground designers, uh, good ones, talk about affordances. Now, I don't know if there's a Turkish word for an affordance, but it's, it's a, a feature in the environment, a physical feature that also makes an offer to a person or a, or a child. So this, this ledge here affords sitting. It's not a seat, but it affords sitting. But if we were outside, and it was, this was hard, a, a hard concrete floor. This would also afford grinding for a skateboarder. The yes, Turkish sir. word is imkan. Okay, thank you. Um, so when you think about playscapes or places or any space in terms of the affordances, you then start to, to, to think more richly and deeply and creatively about the kind of offers that you might make, how they can be multiple offers, maybe uh, appeal in different ways to different children, uh, maybe do different jobs, not just for play, but for sitting or for socializing. So I think affordances is a really helpful design idea. The other thing I just want to say about, about framing the conversation about play and design, uh, I, and indeed about childhood, I often talk about a sort of, what's a good enough, what's a good diet of experience for children. We, we think a lot about a good diet in children's food. Yeah, what's a, what's a balanced diet of food for children? And I think we need to think the same way about children's experiences. How much outdoor play do you prescribe? Yeah. So outdoor play is a pretty important part of a child's diet. And I think time in nature is an important part of a child's diet in nature. And But that doesn't mean you come up with a rule that says every playground has to have dirt and plants. Actually, I do think it's good on the whole for, for, for there to be in a, in a child's neighborhood, in, within daily reach of a child, some green space, some taste of nature, uh, because of what we know about how a little bit, even a little bit of green can make us feel better, can help restore our sense of balance. Uh, but I also think that children need other um, spaces and other opportunities, some of which don't work very well in a natural setting. So, so that, again, the, the diet analogy, I, for me, I, I think it helps. Um, I'll uh, take that to Nissan because uh, they are, as we have heard from Yeet also earlier, uh, Bernard Falnier Foundation has been working intensely with Bo Bosphorus University to create a parent visitation program. And in that, uh, what do you guys advise uh, in that program for uh, outdoor play? Uh, I feel more comfortable if I answer it Turkish. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, we, we need one more headset, pardon. please. Yeah. Pardon? Ee, sen Boğaziçi Üniversitesi ile beraber hazırlanan ev ziyaretleri programının altını çizdin. İstanbul 95 programının iki tane bileşeni var şu anda Türkiye'de uygulanan. Bunlardan bir tanesi ebeveyn rehberliği. Ee, annenin gebeliğinin son aylarından başlayarak bebek 3 yaşına gelene kadar her iki haftada bir e, anneler ziyaret ediliyor. Ve bu ziyaretlerin ilk altı ayı daha çok işte annenin duygu durumu ve beslenmesiyle ilgili ama ve bebekle ilişkisi ama 6 aydan sonra daha işte annenin ebeveyn olan ilişkisine dair de bazı şeyleri destekleyici. Hem aktiviteler oluyor hem de bilgiler veriliyor. Ee, ev ziyaretleri esnasında e, bebek belli bir aya geldikten sonra da aslında e, evde hazırlanmış çok basit işte şampuan kutusundan işte çorabın içerisine pabuk koyarak falan evde hazırladığımız oyuncakları götürüyoruz e, ebeveynlere ve orada hep altını çizmeye çalıştığımız şey İlk üç sene bebeğin beyin gelişimini destekleyen o yüz, yani ilk üç senede beyin gelişimi yüzde 85 tamamlanıyor. 
E, bu beyin gelişimini destekleyen en önemli şeylerden bir tanesi bebeğin ebeveynle kurduğu e, bakım verenleriyle etrafındaki yetişkinlerle kurduğu ilişki ve aslında bu basit oyuncaklar da çok iyi bir araç. E, ama dışarıda oyun oynamaya dair onları e, desteklemek ve motive etmekle ilgili ev ziyaretçileriyle yaptığımız eğitimlerde, aylık toplantılarda da sık sık konuştuğumuz bir şey. Annelere bol bol e, dışarı çıkmayı önermek. E, ama işte bunun iki türlüsü var. Bir aslında ilk aylarda annenin e, daha ruh sağlığına iyi geleceği için, yeni doğum yaptığı için, biraz kendi kendine kalması, temiz hava alması için. Çünkü anne iyi oldukça aslında orada bebekle bir iletişim gelişiyor ve e, iyi oluyor ve o zaman bebeğini dışarı çıkarmaya dair de bir motivasyonu oluyor. Çeşitli sebeplerden bunun olamadığı durumlar var. İşte yani kırkı çıkmadan sokağa çıkarmamak gibi geleneksel şeylerde işte üşür e, ya da etrafta gidecek hiçbir yer yok gibi sebeplerle de ama ev ziyaretlerinde sık sık konuştuğumuz annelerle yani bunu mutlaka yapmalısın gibi değil ama her ziyarette işte bu hafta ne kadar dışarı çıktınız tek mi çıktınız bebekle mi çıktınız gibi bir de çalıştıkça şeyi görüyoruz evdeki diğer kardeşler 3-4 yaşındaki kardeşlerin aslında dışarı çıkması evdeki huzuru daha sağlayan bir şey bebekle o kardeşin ilişkisini de kuvvetlendiren bir şey çünkü o enerjisini attıkça ama tabii bir güvenlik ve risk meselesi var ki işte hep ailelerin de öne sürdüğü. Ee, hala konuşuyoruz. Ee, yol alınıyor. Bir şey daha hemen söylemek istiyorum. Yine İstanbul 95'in e, e, şeylerinden bir tanesi, bileşenlerinden bir tanesi parklar ve yeşil alanlar. E, hep Yiğit açılışta da bahsetti, sen de bahsettin. Yani ilk bin gün e, bir bebeğin ihtiyacı olan tek şey işte bu. 50 santimlik bir tümsek aslında. Yani yeniden kocaman kocaman parklar yapmak değil ama var olan parklara e, o 3 yaşına kadar olan bebeklerin ihtiyacını karşılayacak şeyleri nasıl kurabiliriz? Bir. ikincisi onları parka götürmüş bakım verenlerin hem çocuklarının güvende olduğunu hissedecekleri hem de işte güneşin altında değil de bir gölgeliğin altında oturabilecekleri falan gibi e, şeyler var. Bunu konuşuyoruz yani karalıcılarla da konuşuyoruz annelerle de yani bakım verenlerle de ev ziyaretçisi arkadaşlarla da konuşuyoruz ee, ve tam burada aslında bir soru geliyor time e, aklımıza yani riskten bahs yani keşke daha çok riskten bahsetsek çünkü işte fotoğrafları görünce videoyu seyredince riskler neler olabilir diye konuştukça e, benim kişisel görüşüm o daha az korkulur bir şey oluyor bu risk meselesi sanki ee, bütün bu izlediğimiz, gösterdiğimiz örneklerde e, bakım verenleri, ebeveynleri ve karar alıcıları, politika yapıcıları e, nasıl ikna edebiliriz? Nasıl ikna ediyorsunuz? Böyle bir deneyiminiz var mı? Bir şey sormak istiyorum. Um, you're right that um, the decision makers and the managers and the policy makers and uh, parents need to be on the same page, need to have a shared understanding as far as possible about what a, what a good balance. This is really about balance. I hope everybody sees this. We're not saying children should be out playing uh, uh, in, in busy traffic or in, uh, on the edge of a cliff. <laughs> We're saying, um, let's create some uncertainty and some challenge, but still within a, a reasonable limit. And of course, that question, what is reasonable, is a difficult question. And I think, in the end, I think you need to solve it by having conversations, by getting the different parties to think through the issues. Uh, and did that will look different here in Istanbul than in Norway. Um, and it will look different in Taiwan. And it will look different in Johannesburg. But the basic discussion, still, there's still that need to make visible, to make visible the importance of risk and challenge and to um, 
to it. It's, it's almost like, you know, with, with Alcoholics Anonymous, they say the first step is to recognize you have a problem. And, and I think in many countries when I go, I would say, do you think you have a problem with risk? Do you have really boring playgrounds? Do you have everybody terrified that a child has a scrape or a bruise and they're going to get a lawsuit? Because then you have a problem. And let's get around the table and try and talk about how to solve it. And in the UK, that really is what we did. We had a group of people at the national level called the Play Safety Forum. Uh, and I was one of those people, and we agreed we had a problem. And the regulators, and the lawyers, and the municipalities, and the accident prevention charities all agreed that this, what I call the zero risk mindset, was too hard, was, was, was giving us too many problems. And we took two years to draw up a statement that said, we have a problem and we need to have a new approach. And then it took five more years to come up with the, uh, the, the playground safety manual. Uh, so, but now we've done all the hard work, so it will take less time here in Turkey because you can learn from our efforts and our mistakes. Avcay, you want to say something? Uh, this reminded me of... Uh, um, of a uh, comics in Nickelodeon, it was called The Safety Queen. So, uh, like in one episode, a, a child has a band-aid on his knee and he's, he wants to tear it off, but he's afraid. And the safety queen uh, comes with her pogo stick with the cask uh, and don't stop, don't, don't take it out because uh, you will take it out and you will scream and the one driver will hear it and he will hit the tree and uh, other cars will hit that too and like makes this huge scenario and the guy and uh, the child just makes this and it's gone uh, but then she goes away so uh, I mean I see parents turn turning into safety queens and <laughs> kings um, I wanted to ask a question really quickly on parents um, different parents have different attitudes really important so of course some of the parents I'm sure there are parents in this room and some of you work with parents there are some parents who are very anxious, there are some parents who are not so anxious, and in, in the UK now, and in some other countries, there's a growing number of parents who say, we've all got too anxious, yeah? We all need to lighten up, we need to uh, give our children a little bit more freedom. And that's a growing movement of parents. In, in, in America, you can find a blog called Free Range Kids. Um, and so I think in any country you'll find that, that there will be a, a continuum, there'll be a range of views. And sometimes parents get blamed for things that are not just their fault. Um, and I think sometimes schools and municipalities need to recognize there's sometimes a, a silent group of parents or even maybe a majority of parents who, who don't want the super safe playgrounds, who don't want, uh, who aren't going to sue the school if their child comes home with a bruise on their knee. Um, and they need to be a little bit, maybe a little bit firmer with the very, very anxious and the very vocal parents. Mm -hmm. Aga wants to say something here. Anecdote to this, um, and you might have all experienced it, but very often accidents happen when the parent is actually very nearby because then children suddenly feel very safe and they say, mommy, look without hands. And when they're on their own, they don't even try. Sometimes a parent will say to a child, try this. Be, no, be careful. Mm -hmm. Now, th th those girls, you think the girls climbing across that fallen tree, what's the one thing that we can sure about what the, those girls were doing? The girls were being careful. So if you're a child and you're being careful, and a grown-up standing there who's saying, be careful. Okay, there's only really two ways you can take that. The first way is you start, you panic. You think, maybe I've, I've, have I missed something? Um, and then you, yeah, maybe you have an accident. The second way is the child thinks, the grown-ups are stupid. Can't they see I'm being careful? 
so the lesson there, the child thinks, oh, I'm not going to listen to what the grown-ups say anymore because they're not looking and seeing that I'm being careful. So uh, I, it's, it's, we really need to be, uh, to be careful about how we intervene. And one thing I wanted to point out about that, that little video clip, I forgot to say this, but one really important lesson, any educators in the room, any early childhood educators, there were educators in that frame, they were close to the children, they did not step in at any point. Yes, they didn't say, be careful. They didn't say, look out for that branch, it's about to fall and hit you. They knew the children and they had confidence that the children were able to manage those risks for themselves. Um, and that's a really important skill for educators. <laughs> yes. I, um, yeah, I think it's really important as we talk about play and think about developing playgrounds and also you know, kind of urban networks for play to think about essentially parents being taken out of the equation or the option for parents to be taken out of the equation because um, I think it's really important for children to be able to go places to play on their own so that this idea that there always has to be like this circle of parents standing around is as you've said, not helpful, um, they're often not provisioned for, and children need to be able to find their own friends, and that the whole idea of connected play that I talked about is really about kids being able to leave their house, access open space, and access their friends without a parent um, being part of every act interaction. Um, the other aspect of that, which you also alluded to, um, is educators, but also play workers, and especially in England, there's this long tradition of play workers supervising the junk playgrounds that I mentioned. And um, there's this great book called The Playwork Primer that talks about the play worker as somebody who, who stands and watches um, and only intervenes when necessary. And I've talked to play workers and they say, you know, parents find that impossible. Like we, we really want to like get the parents like off the playground. There's a junk playground in New York City and there's a sign outside that says, your children are fine without your advice or suggestions. <laughs> so you know, parents are part of the problem and the play worker is just has a different relationship to the child, has a different emotional temperature towards the child. And so creating places where that, that kind of adult can be part of the play experience rather than a parent is also really important as like, we're thinking more broadly about play um, and design. Oh, sorry. Now you can. <laughs> There's a book um, called The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of Bicameral Mind by uh, Julian James, written in the 70s. He's a, a biologist and psychologist. Uh, he says well, lots of things, but like one of the points he makes is that uh, he defines consciousness as uh, not being uh, memory or intelligence. It's uh, something else. And then uh, he illustrates that it's not actually uh, critical in learning or performing. So you can actually learn without, uh, you can learn unconsciously. Uh, the, what the kids were doing in the woods were they, they were learning a lot of things, like they were learning physics, nature, and everything, but in an unconscious way. Um, and also, this is the, I mean, this is valid uh, during the play. Uh, I see play as almost like a performance. So uh, the kid is actually doing something and he's, he's concentrated when he's on, the, on this wood or when he's uh, climbing bars. So saying be careful to the kid is a kind of a distracting um, uh, her from, from what she is doing. It's almost like saying um, while a, pi a pianist is playing a, a concerto, like, oh, your fingers are moving. So it really it kills your um, train of thought or train of... Action. I have a kind of dumb question to Elia. What is more risky, a playground or a car? <laughs> I'm going to um, sort of rephrase it and say risk is about what we accept. And having said that, if you compare uh, injuries on the playground, and I saw some numbers, but I think they were absolute. If you look at it, there's hardly any serious injuries uh, happening in playgrounds, but we do accept uh, a lot of car accidents with really bad injuries because we think that's necessary in our society. So we always have to think about this before we 
discuss risk because risk has a very broad, uh, widespread, um, or is actually very subjective. Um, having said that, playing in general sports, um, uh, you mentioned soccer, rugby might be a little bit too rough, but um, playing uh, is very often less dangerous than soccer, also for the type of injuries. Because the type of injuries with playing soccer, what we all do, you've got torn ligaments where you, have, you don't have that on the playground. Um, injuries are very often, and now I bring it back to Istanbul, 95, related to the age of children. Young children fall, always fall on their head. When they're a little bit older, they break their wrists. Then it goes down to the knees and the ankles. And when I tell it, everybody goes, yeah, yeah, that's right. But we never ever discuss these kind of things when we're discussing risks, injuries, etc. But all in all, I'm saying there's not much risk involved in a playground. And the only thing we need to do is uh, discuss what is acceptable, as you said. Well, uh, if, it, if they can estimate the risk based on their motor skills and cognitive skills uh, that belongs to a certain age, and uh, get all the cars out of the city. <laughs> I, I think we saw from Alexandra's presentation, in a way, the story of the child in the city in the last 150 years is really the story of a battle between children and cars, and for the most part, the cars have won uh, and are still winning. Um, and, but maybe that's changing, that's beginning to change, and there are some cities that are uh, getting a better balance between the needs of car drivers and the needs of children and older people and everybody else. Give us an uplifting example, please. Oh. Um, well, I guess the poster boy is, is Copenhagen, I think, where Rotterdam, I mean, there are, in Copenhagen for the past 30 or 40 years, um, uh, the city has been taking out car parks and making them into public spaces has been uh, uh, reducing street widths so that uh, there can be more pavements and But there's cycling. still no kids really that play on the street in Copenhagen though. Um, there are some play streets in Copenhagen. Uh, you're right, it's not, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it, where, where is the battle going? Yes, who, who, who are making, the, where, is, where is their territory being won? And in Copenhagen, territory is being won back for people and being taken away from the cars. And there are some streets, uh, I've seen them in, in Copenhagen, where children can play. Um, there are some examples now of um, new city districts that have completely reconfigured the layout. The classic example here is Vauban, Vauban in Freiburg, which is a city district that has about 10,000 people. Um, on, on the edge of Freiburg that was built on an old military site in the 1990s. And, and actually partly it emerged through campaigning and squatting and uh, green uh, environmental movement. And it's now a model sustainable neighborhood. And the whole of the public realm, all of the spaces between the buildings are for playing, for socializing, for families and residents to enjoy and there's very low levels of car ownership because there's great public transport and there's great cycle networks and the, the families that do own cars they have to park them in a big car park on the edge of the development so the value of that the values the philosophy the politics if you like of that neighborhood are a politics that says we are not building this neighborhood for cars we are building this neighborhood for people children, families. And so it's an expression of the values of, of that community. Amsterdam, sorry, I'm from Amsterdam. But the main circular route in Amsterdam, all cars are visiting there now. It's cycling area. This is really a big thing. Just take out the cars. We are building car parks. We take out all car park spaces out of the street, creating larger sidewalks, so you can just uh, play in front of your house. You can see what is passing through, you're not being blocked by the cars anymore. So 
what I want to say, if we start doing this, and this is in the old city, not a new built area, we took out even traffic lights that makes, the, strangely enough, the crossing safer because you pay attention. Uh, people find that hard to believe. But what I'm saying, if we add up all these small things that we can do in the city, we can make it a livable city for children again. So it's not new built areas. It can just happen. If it can happen in Amsterdam, it can happen in Istanbul. And maybe if, uh, people are thinking, oh, oh, I always come to these conferences and I hear people talking about the Netherlands and Germany and um, Denmark and it will never happen in Istanbul. It will never happen in Turkey. It took a few years. I, maybe you should look at Bogota. Yes, yeah. you talk about the mayor of Bogota and what he did to tackle the dominance of the car in that city, which is a pretty, uh, it's not, it's, it's a pretty different place to Copenhagen. And he and various mayors in Bogota have managed to get a better balance between cars and everybody else. And in the case of Bogota, the mayor of Bogota, Enrique Peñalosa, said, I think the child is an indicator species for cities. If a city works well for children, it works for everyone. And he, I think, has put that vision into practice. He said, I want to make the sidewalks safe again, so the sidewalks are not dominated by parked cars. I want to create more parks. So there are some examples in Bogota of exactly what I said, of, of, of car parks that have been turned into uh, play and public spaces. Um, so, you know, this, th that's a tough city with a big population, a lot of the problems of, of poor planning, um, of, of poverty, of uh, income inequality that you have in many cities, and still he's, and uh, you know, he and his team and other mayors have made a difference and improved the lives of children and families in that city. Şimdi bütün bunların üzerine işte aklıma şöyle bir şey geliyor. Ee, başlangıç kitliği bir şey var. Ee, Bernard Van Lier Vakfı'nın hazırladığı dışarıdaki masanın üzerinde de var. Yarın da getiririz bol bol. Umarım şey e, herkes faydalanır. İçinde e, çeşitli örnekler var. E, oyunla ilgili yani şehrin belli yerlerinde işte kocaman parklar ya da işte keşfetmeye uygun doğaya gerek olmadan işte ayın belli zamanlarında bir gün e, sabahtan öğlene kadar bir sokağı kapatmak ve orada sokakta oynamak. E, ya da işte kul, mesela işte okul bahçelerinin kullanılmadığı zamanlarda orada işte böyle bir oyun setup'u kurmak ya da işte okuma e, şeyleri, aktiviteleri yapmak parklarda falan gibi. Yani bu oyun meselesi ne tabii ki hani sabaha kadar konuşabiliriz bir sürü bileşeni var ama bütün bunları konuşurken aklıma şey geldi yani hep çocuklar için bir şey yapıyoruz işte park çocuklar için parklar yapıyoruz çocuklar için çocuklar için falan ama e, bence önce yetişkinler için bir şey yapmak gerekiyor o da yani hani işte e, kamusal alanda düzenlenen oyunlara işte yetişkinleri katmak onların onlarla bir şey düzenlemek yani işte çocuk gelişimcilerle sokakta, parkta okuma etkinliği değil de belki işte anneleri babaları davet ederek parkta okuma etkinliği yapmak ya da işte bu risklerden konuşurken kendi aramızda konuştuğumuzda da yani işte tasarımcı da olsa, bir karar alıcı da olsa ilk masaya gelen şey e, ama çok riskli yani belki yani işte o riskin altını açmak gerekiyor yani 5 metre bir yere tırmandığında e, düştüğünde başına ne geliyor e, ve hani ona ne kadar zarar verebiliyor gibi daha somut somut yani riskin ne olduğunu konuşmak gerekiyor. Yani risk deyince böyle kulağa korkunç bir şey geliyor ama yani 3 yaşında bir çocuğun oyunu oynarken başına gelebilecek şey yani hakikaten işte araba kullanma örneğiyle karşılaştırıldığında hiçbir şey olabilir. Any comments? Uh, I'd like to also get some questions from the audience. Uh, if, if it's time, I don't know if you... Uh, when we open up the questions. Soru gibi formüle edersek daha mutlu oluruz. Arkada var galiba bir soru. Hi. Uh, not being from Turkey, I guess I'd like to ask 
what you from Turkey see as specifically Turkish about this issue of play. How do you, how do you contextualize this here? Anyone in the audience who wants to answer this? <laughs> I'll give it a shot uh, and I'm sure Avshar will have uh, some additions to it. I think in a, in a funny way, this is a city where children still play in the streets. Um, it's, not, it's not in the rich neighborhoods, it's not in the cores. So the, the older the neighborhood and then the, the poorer the neighborhood, there's a lot of play on the street. And it's actually when we conducted also uh, some workshops with children um, during the exercise with Bernard van Leer Foundation, in some places that's what we heard, we play in the street. So we, there is a way of coexisting. It's not, I don't think it's a healthy way of coexisting because it's, it's not necessarily regulated in, in, a, in a clever way. Not that regulation will lead us better results, I don't think so, but uh, I think not always will necessarily give us better results, but more regulation. Uh, but it's, it's not really carefully, it's not really thought about so much, but it exists. Um, what else is uh, peculiar with play? I think one thing that's sad about play in Istanbul that doesn't happen is that it doesn't happen all year around. We actually have a wonderful climate um, and we don't go outside enough, um, I think, um, and that I can testify uh, knowing part, part of our, uh, because of my partner Gregor, who is from Denmark, we, we do end up in Copenhagen quite, quite a lot and to see that all kinds of climate is possible to, to play outside in is, uh, I, I would really like uh, to discuss this further, like, yes, you can play outside with children even newborns. I mean, they have a tradition of leaving newborns outside in their strollers in the snow. So, uh, so th this, I think, is an interesting to, thing to know that it, it can happen and they survive. I mean, there is a small population of only five million people, but <laughs> they, they haven't, you know, they still survive. <laughs> so I, I think that uh, the whole nation of, uh, notion of how we think about environment, the outside, uh, there is problems. Uh, it needs to be thought through. In my opinion, we can uh, see and detect uh, certain patterns in children's play, um, but uh, we shouldn't fall into this uh, pitfall of uh, overgeneralizing uh, mm -hmm. these notions. Uh, when you only take, let's say, Istanbul as an example, you will see that uh, a child in um, 2000s uh, play differently than 90s, than 80s, than 70s. Uh, when you read like uh, memoirs and people like talking about their uh, child childhood in these books, you see it's almost entirely different in each decade. Uh, there's something um, different going on. And thus, I want to uh, turn this comment into a question and uh, shoot it to you. Um, uh, how much and in what scope do you think this information we gather is um, universal, like how, how transferable or how uh, generalizable it is? That's a question I'm still trying to answer. Um, most, of, most of my work and my travel and my experience is based on high-income countries, on, on the UK where I live, on Northern Europe, um, North America and Australia. Uh, and until, oh, and, and a little bit Japan, but until two years ago, I had never visited for, for work a, a lower middle income country. So when I went to Bogota two and a half years ago, it was an open question for me. I, I, I just, I met some people who are interested in design and children. Actually, it was the Bernard Van Leer Foundation who, who got me to Bogota. And I said, look, here is what I think is going on and some insights from my experience from these countries. You tell me, is this relevant to your situation and your children and your cities? Or, or is it just, are, are we on a different page? Are we in a, starting in a different area? And people were saying, yes, what you're saying is relevant. Um, and uh, so I think of course, it's not exactly the same, but firstly, of course, it's true in many cities, in, even in 
in many parts of the world, you have a growing middle class, and you have a growing um, a bureaucracy of schools and services, and where you have that, you have questions about risk, and you have questions about child safety that maybe don't happen when you don't have those, that basic situation. So, and I, I'm also, I'm very clear that it's, you know, I shouldn't be going in and talking about having natural playgrounds with water and, and trees if, if, if children are living in, in, in neighbourhoods with open sewers um, and, and, and no good water or sanitation. That's, that's not um, appropriate. But, you know, a lot of cities are, of course, attacking those basic problems of, of environmental hazards. They're not completely solved, but they are being addressed. And so then these questions about public space and mobility and play start to be asked. And so far, mm. I get the feeling the questions are similar. And on the whole, the answers are fairly similar too. But I'm prepared to, for someone to come up and tell me it's different in my city or it's different in my country. The question, right, you say it's changing over time. But isn't that, isn't that parental behavior that has actually changed what children are doing over time? Because if I would go out with three Turkish kids, three English, three American, three Dutch, actually nine Turkish kids, and we bring them to your truck in the movie, they don't even speak the same language, there will be no problem at all. Within half an hour, they would do all the same kind of things. And that actually, for me, expresses that playing is universal. We can discuss the differences, but we should discuss the similarities. And from that point of view, bringing expertise from all over the world, if that is Patagonia or Korea, or is always valuable because you exchange this and discover that it is the same. Just to pick up on the kind of temporal aspect of your question, I mean, one of the, like, one of the reasons that I wrote my book was because I had children. And I was struck by how different their childhood seemed from my childhood. And I wanted to know if that was anecdotal or whether it was a his, you know, historic. And it turned out basically it was historic. You know, I grew up in the 1970s, and the 1970s um, was an incredibly progressive time in the United States on a number of levels. And so the childhood that I experienced was different than the childhood my children are experiencing. And in fact, our, our understanding of risk, at least in the US context, is really conditioned by a series of regulations that happened in the 1980s um, and are very related to a lot of regulations, including um, kind of more strict education system that was put in by Ronald Reagan and kind of sta standards-based education. So um, it was important for me to be able to see childhood as this construct that's in time and to try to unpick some of the kind of reasons why childhood today seems different and I mean, I think that was like the purpose of my writing and a lot of my purpose as a critic is to provide people with this greater context because I think then they can see their own behavior is conditioned by their time and that helps people to examine their behavior and kind of examine the whys of the built environment around them. You have a question then? Yeah. yeah. No, not yet, okay. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Pardon. Evet. Ee, ben riskle ilgili bir soru sormak istiyorum. Aslında iki tane sorum var. Biri projeyle ilgili. Risk sadece çocuğun e, yapacaklarından kaynaklanmıyor diye düşünüyorum. Oynadığı alanda başına geleceklerden kendisiyle ilgili yaptığı o anda uğraştığı şeyle ilgili yapacaklarından e, kaynaklanmıyor diye düşünüyorum. Özellikle belki bizim güvensizlik içerisinde yaşıyor olmamızla alakalı ama yabancıların açık alanlarda bulunmasından da kaynaklanıyor. Ben okul öncesi kurumunda öğretmenim. 
E, velilerime çocukların açık alanda oynaması gerekliliğini anlatabiliyorum. E, alması gerektiğini, risk alması gerektiğini anlatabiliyorum çocuklar açısından. Velilerin endişelerine cevaplar verebiliyorum. Ancak yabancılardan gelebileceklere dair endişelerine cevap veremiyorum. Ben kendimi de bu konuda ikna edemediğim için veremiyorum. E, size şunu sormak istiyorum. Bu risk e, tabii ki çocukların bu konuda eğitildiğini düşünerek alınması gereken bir risk mi? Yoksa o açık alanları da güvenlikle, güvenlik görevlileriyle, işte kameralarla güvenli hale getirmeli miyiz? Hangisini öneririz? önerirsiniz diye sormak istiyorum. Proje ile ilgili de e, açıkçası bunun çok fazla yaygınlaşması gerektiğine inanıyorum. E, paydaşlarınızda kurumlar var mı? Okul öncesi kurumlar, e, eğitmenler ve çocuklar var mı? Bunu merak ediyorum. Bence muhatap çocuklar kesinlikle ya da bu alanda çalışan tabii ki öğretmenler. E, ama önce çocuklar diye düşünüyorum. Hani çocukların nasıl bir çevrede oynamak istediklerine dair hayal dünyalarını keşfetmek bence e, aradığımız şeye bir cevap olabilir. E, geçen sene 4 yaşta çalıştım ve inanılmaz keyifliydi gerçekten. Bahçemizin nasıl olması gerektiğine dair e, düşünmelerini istedim. Bunun resmini yaptık ve idareye giderek anlatmalarını istedim. Çok güzel şeyler teklif ettiler. E, çok küçük bir bahçemiz var onlara yetmiyor. Gerçekten çok güzel anlamlı istekleri olmuştu. Ben çocuklara kulak vermek gerektiğine inanıyorum. Evet. Teşekkürler. Teşekkürler. Um, I'm sure this question is a, çok teşekkürler. Çok iyi bir soruydu. Um, the fear of the outsiders, the, it must come up fairly often. I'm sure there's good data you can share with us. So, I think in, in my experience, every society, every nation has their horror stories about tragedies that's happened to children. And many of us, we can name the children. Um, they're in incredibly searing. Uh, they, they sear themselves on our memory. But they're also, and I almost hesitate because it sounds heartless to say it, but they do this precisely because they are so incredibly rare. Um, and uh, so, I, I, I think it helps to put that in a context. Uh, we were talking earlier about car traffic and, and car danger. Really, and that wonderful word acceptable, what's acceptable and unacceptable. Now, I don't think it actually that, I don't think it's acceptable that a child can be two foot in the wrong place and can die because they happen to be two feet out in the wrong place. I think that's an unacceptable level of risk. I think that, um, it's not tolerable. It's not a risk that we should tolerate. Whereas, I, I, I, I'm sorry to say that in every society, there are a tiny number of people who pose real harm to children who they don't know. And I, my, I wish that were not the case, but I also don't think we can let the existence of those people um, uh, destroy the childhoods of everybody, because that risk is so infinitesimal. Uh, that is of no comfort to the, those families who've had that experience. But I think everybody else, we need to say, look, what, what, what do you lose if you assume that everybody, that, that every neighborhood is full of people who want to do harm to your child? What do we lose? We lose everything that matters. We lose trust. We lose a sense of connection. Um, we lose almost that, that sort of basic sense that the world is okay. So I, I guess I want to say most of the countries I work in, um, most people are kind to each other, most people are kind to children, and there are levels of trust that, that people have with each other that help to make our communities places that, that are good places to live and that give our lives meaning. And if we start from the premise that we, we cannot afford to um, let our children play in a park because there might be this predatory person out there, then we've, we've lost all that's, almost all that's good about childhood. Um, and so I, I, I think it's like a bogeyman story. It's, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a myth. Um, and that's the, that, that's the right way to see those. Yeah, as far as I know, I don't remember now the numbers correctly, but uh, the number of children who get hurt by outsiders is much, much, much less than people who get hurt by people they know. 
So the isn't that correct? Like I'm. Do yes. Anyone in, can in, articulate in, this better than I. In the UK, it's it's true. Um, uh, it, it's orders of magnitude different. So so ten, twenty, a hundred times more likely that as a child you'll be you'll be um, abused or badly hurt by an adult who you know, a family member, or someone in your extended um, family. Th the trouble is, though, that that doesn't necessarily help eliminate that fear, um, because it's a, it's a bogeyman fear. And, I, and I, as I say, I think the way we, we try and eliminate it is by saying what we lose if we let that fear determine our choices. of uh, distrust and precarity. Um, so we are um, constantly anxious uh, and about things like uh, so many, so many dangers, so many risks and so on. But instead of um, trying to baby-proof the, the whole universe, uh, we should find ways as like intelligent people, we have to find ways around them. Uh, we cannot um, eliminate the, the presence of strangers or the threat of cars in, in one day. But uh, maybe we should put all these uh, dependencies on one side, uh, all, the, all the things which define uh, how and where and how long the kid uh, plays. And on the other side, we should take the, um, the parametrics of, of the play itself, the play behavior, like uh, uh, competence, excitement, adventure, uh, dependence, and so on, and try to like find a balance between them. Alexander, would you like to talk about Eyes on the Street and Jane, uh, Jane Jacobs a little for us? Uh, yes. Um, well, it's just that his historical development patterns of streets actually um, had essentially an affordance for that kind of, for the neighborhood watching the child rather than for just the parent needing to be watching their own child at all times. Um, yeah, and the most famous example of that is Jane Jacobs. Um, she talks about the sidewalk ballet in her neighborhood and the eyes on the street. That was, you know, kind of a low rise row house neighborhood with stoops and there, and it had a shop on the corner. So there were just people around all day long. Um, and you know, people going in and out of their houses, shopkeepers, et cetera, and that community created um, eyes on children if they were playing on the street. So it wasn't always this kind of one-to-one -one ratio of parent to child, and, it, and all the responsibility didn't fall on the, um, the single family. And I think as we see um, you know, more child-friendly developments, they try to build in that as part of the building pattern. I mean, that's, that's what courtyard housing is. That's what all of this sort of flipped housing with the connected space that, that Christopher Ale Alexander always talked about is trying to build in that collective vision rather than making everything kind of individualistic like the single family home. Pedro had a question earlier. I already touched, Alexander already touched my question a little bit. Uh, it, was, it was about community. And I mean, because we talked about space, spaces for play, and then we started to talk about the city itself, uh, the problem of cars, etc. And my question was, was in that direction about the, the scales, the community scale, and, and what sort of, uh, how can you approach this? How can you approach uh, thinking a city for kids in terms of how communities can be organized, what scale of communities can be organized, how can you, uh, in our actual cities, how can you respond to density, how can you respond to gentrification, which means also changing the communities who are, which are in a certain, certain zones and, and how these things, they, they affect the city as a, as a play space. in one <laughs> but I guess I guess I know I know 
Um, I think I'm going to talk about like the, the kind of design piece and like what kind of design works because I, um, I referred in passing to Falls Creek South in Vancouver and I should say at the outset that um, so my book is very focused on North America and in fact I was told as I was writing it not to use too many examples from Scandinavia and Northern Europe because Americans are kind of tired of people telling them that it's better in Copenhagen and it's better in Amsterdam. So I end up having to go to Canada to find my good example <laughs> because I feel like Americans feel like Can Canadians are, are maybe not so different. So um, the, the Falls Creek South neighborhood that I mentioned, um, which was developed in sort of from the 1970s to the 90s, I think has a model that is replicable in other dense cities. And the model um, is a version of courtyard housing um, that goes up to five or six stories has car parking kind of in the back and, and has both central green spaces and then access to kind of shared streets that connect to public parks. So I think the really important part of that model is this idea of layering from private to public space and giving families, I would say, like a very small kind of um, garden or um, balcony where they can have a barbecue grill or you know some equivalent and then a courtyard that's kind of overlooked by all the families that has public access but isn't kind of on the public street and then you have a public street where other people are and it connects to a green space so it's it's it's this idea of scales and layering um, and that that's at not the highest scale like not the high-rise scale of housing though I think it can be combined in some cases with high rises, but it's in this medium scale where um, a, the parent still feels some connection to the ground, you know, ground oriented development, and the child also can identify their own home as part of this collective so they don't get lost. Um, and so I, yeah, I guess I feel like it has been built, we can find these models, but um, we sometimes have to look to slightly older patterns of, of development. Uh, any, um, we, we can, uh, yeah, please. I want to just pick up on your, again, one aspect of the question about gentrification. Um, I think there is some evidence from some cities that the movement to make neighbourhoods more child friendly, especially when it's, when it's partly a kind of bottom up or a, or a community based movement, um, can have the sort of side effect of fueling gentrification. So, you know, I, I can think of some neighbourhoods where groups of families have come together, um, reclaimed parks, um, maybe reorganised the streets, uh, campaigned, and middle class articulate families can often be quite good at campaigning to get the traffic down. And then, of course, the neighbourhood starts to be seen as more desirable, more families want to move in, they like the green space, and not just families, because again, what works for children often works for everybody. Rents and, and housing costs go up, uh, and poorer families are, over time, pushed out of those neighbours or made to feel unwelcome. So that's a real, I think that is not just, uh, that is a reality, I think that's a, that is a real risk in some cities. I taken out also to densify the area. So, because the, the area becomes so, uh, only the very wealthiest can afford. And what, so, so we need to have, I think, an equity element whenever we, when we're talking about making neighbourhoods more child friendly. It's good to capitalise. It's good to to harness the energy of families who live in in neighbourhoods to make them better. But it's it's also important to recognise that, firstly, that if. if that can lead to unintended consequences and it can also lead to inequality and unfairness because the neighbourhoods where there are very few families that have that capacity are the neighbourhoods that get left behind. Um, so really that comes down to, to, to questions about political priorities. And you know, Rotterdam was one of the cities that I've looked at for its work on child friendliness. I, I think it can be accused of saying its, its focus on child friendliness was too targeted so that all of its efforts were being devoted to, to some neighbourhoods and there were other neighbourhoods, sometimes poorer neighbourhoods, that were, were, were being left behind. And I think um, that's, 
uh, uh, that's certainly not something I can defend. Okay, we'll take one last question. Merhaba, genelde doğa ve fiziksel Merhaba, genelde doğa ve fiziksel oyunlar hakkında konuştuk ama günümüzde çocuklar aynı zamanda bir dijital dünyaya da doğuyorlar ve o ilk bin gününde akıl telefonlarla tanışmış oluyorlar. Ve İstanbul gibi şehirlerde de doğal ortamların olmadığı şehirlerde daha çok dijital oyuna yöneliyorlar. Bir şekilde bunun evrimleşmesi bu şekilde ilerliyor. Aslında Vire gibi teknolojilerle bu ikisinin ee, doğanın mesela eksik olduğu yerlerle dijital bir şekilde tamamlanabileceğini düşünüyorum. Bu konuda sizin öngörüleriniz nedir? Ya da gelecekteki oyun hakkındaki ya da oyun ortamları hakkındaki fikirleriniz nelerdir? Onu sormak istedim. Teşekkürler. Um, okay, first of all, I'm no expert in digital things at all, so I have no idea what it means for the first thousand days and how they actually perceive that uh, in their brain. Um, I think there are two worlds apart. We should not say one is better than the other. Uh, but if you don't encounter a natural environment with your kids, you have a problem. So you should embrace both worlds, the digital world and the natural world. But they are uh, complementary, they're not the same thing. And what we try to do is because we live in a digital world, we think we can implement that in a playground, but I think a playground generally is for physical activity, uh, much more than for um, cognitive digital activities by digital stimulation, let me put it that way. There are some crossovers where you might be able to implement it, but generally, a playground or nature is for children to unwittingly explore, um, discover, and do things that they don't do at home or with uh, before or with a screen. That's my opinion. You have something to add, yeah. Again, I'm also not a, a child development expert, but. Uh, from again, from all the experience of the studio and uh, our observations and research, uh, I think um, uh, being exposed to uh, moving images uh, at an early stage um, makes the child more um, um, uh, impatient. Uh, they they expect uh, the things they see to to move, and when they don't move, they become frustrated and they get like easily bored. Um, I don't know if, whether this is proven or not with the, with the research, but I will say, and this is kind of uh, maybe being too uh, assertive, but I think the, the child won't be missing much if, he, if she doesn't see any digital screen until the age of three or four or five. <laughs> <laughs> Çocuk gelişim uzmanı değilim ama e, bu yaptığımız iş vesilesiyle bir sürü araştırma sonucuyla yaptığımız iş nasıl daha kolay anlatabiliriz gibi şeylere düşüyoruz. E, çok anlaşılır araştırmalar var. Bunlardan bir tanesi e, 3 yaşına kadar yani bu e, 11 aylık çocuklarla yapılmış zannedersem bir ekrana bakarak e, bir Japoncanın bir işte şeyi Japonca benzer bir dili öğretiyor şey. E, bir ekrana bakarak çocuklar o dili öğreniyorlar, dinliyorlar, maruz kalıyorlar. Ee, bir de gerçekten onunla böyle birebir karşılıklı konuşan e, bir bakım verenle. Ve bir süre sonra e, e, o şeyi maruz kalan çocuklar, e, öğrenme sürecinde maruz kalan çocuklardan ekrana bakarak e, bakanlar o dili duyduklarında hiç tepki vermiyorlar. Ama karşılıklı e, o dile yani karşıda canlı bir insanla interaksiyonla o dile maruz kalmış olan çocuklar e, o seslere tepki veriyorlar. E, yani ilk üç yaşa kadar hani 
Geçen gün bir şey duydum işte video oyunu tasarlamak sanat mıdır değil midir diye artık yani her yerde bu dijital hikaye hani asla dışında bırakılmamalı bu eğitim hikayesinin ya da çocuk gelişim hikayesinin ama e, o sürekli ekrana bakıyor olma meselesi aslında hani işte böyle kapatıp kafayı böyle 3 yaşına kadar olan çocuklar için söylüyorum yine altını çiziyorum çocuk gelişimcisi değilim dinlediğimiz araştırmalardan ama ee, o ekrana bakma aktivitesi zihni kapatıp böyle hiçbir şey düşünmeden ya da işte o beyinde hiçbir interaksiyonun gerçekleşmediği anlara denk geliyor gibi araştırma var. Peki çok teşekkür ederiz. Since you guys I says, just keep them. Um, okay, um, I'm gonna end in Turkish. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us. E, bu şey katıldığınız için e, bize güzel sorularla tartışmamıza destek olduğunuz için de çok teşekkür ederiz. E, bu konuya riskle başlamayı özellikle istedik. E, çünkü e, bunun ilk başta Timin de söylediği gibi bu konuda bir der sorunumuz var. E, ve e, biz ben, İstanbul 95 programının bir paydaşı olarak e, bu, bu konuyu konuşabilmek ve bu konuda ilerleyebilmek istiyoruz tasarımcı olarak aslında. Çünkü e, bir anne olarak da ee, o çocukların e, Tim'in gösterdiği videonun sonundaki o heyecanı bütün çocukların yaşayabilmesini e, hayal ederek e, bu şehri düşünmek istiyoruz. O yüzden o imkanı tanımak e, ve parkı düşünürken de ilk başta en kritik konulardan biri olan yani park eğer heyecanlı değilse bir şey çocuğun zaten yapabildiğinin üstünde bir şey imkan vermiyorsa ona yapmanın da gereği yok. Ee, o yüzden bununla başlamak istedik. Ee, Aleksandra da bize e, bunun biraz e, daha tarihsel e, çerçevesini e, verdi. Onun için de çok teşekkür ederiz. E, gene bu e, panelde bulunan kişileri tekrar tekrar e, beraber konuşuyor olacağız e, bu iki gün boyunca. Bir yandan da e, yarın Elger sunacak, e, Tim konuşuyor olacak onunla ilgili ya da ba başka türlü bir e, kombinasyon olacak. Bunu da istedik çünkü derinleşmek istiyoruz. Yani bu bu, bu sadece böyle 15'er dakika bir şeyler konuşup e, dinleyip sonra derinleşmediğimiz değil. E, ama yarın da buradaysanız daha da derine indiğimiz e, konuşma yapabilmek istiyoruz. Dijital konusu da bunun içinde tabii ki tekrar buna da dönebiliriz. E, ama şehir, şehirde oyun e, birinci konumuz. E, buradan da yarın devam edeceğiz. Şimdi ara veriyoruz. E, saat 6.30'da değişik bir şekilde biz... E, şeyi programını erken yapan bir e, grup olduk. <gülüyor> Biraz erken gidiyoruz bugün. E, 6.45 diye duyurmuştuk ama 6.30'da başlayacağız. E, Sicilya'nın bize harika bir sunumu var e, ve arkasından Fikret Bey ile beraber yine bir e, kısa yorum ve tartışma olacak. E, dünyanın farklı yerlerinden yine çok güzel örnekler dinleyeceğiz e, ama önce bir kahve içelim. E, tekrar görüşmek üzere 6.30'da.